Um, we came into metabolism almost serendipitous. Uh, as you will see, my lab has been working on chromatin and epigenetics for many years. Uh, when I started my own lab, we were focusing on one particular protein called sir 2 in 6 or sir 6 uh, and we will see how it relates to, to metabolism. Uh, so we started working on this group of proteins called sir 2 uh, They were first uh, originally discovered in yeast um, in a screening for silencers. It came out of a silencing mutation screening, and they identified uh, these protein sirtuins. And the reason why they work as, um, as, as silencers is because they basically, in yeast, work as histone deacetylases. They can remove acetyl groups from histones, uh, compacting chromatin, and by compacting chromatin, uh, repress expression of, of their target genes. Uh, so when we started working on mammalians, there was very little known about the mammalian homologs of this ESIR2. One unique characteristic of these chromatin factors was uh, their dependence of NAD, of NAD. So they all use NAD as a cofactor, as an uh, absolute required cofactor for their catalytic activity. And people in the field immediately realized that if they use NAD as a cofactor, some of these chromatin factors may be sensing changing uh, changes in metabolism that depend on or, or determine the NAD and ADH ratio and acting upon to bring back homeostasis. Uh, again, this was all done originally in East. You are probably familiar with sirtuins because several works, mostly from people here in Boston, uh, have shown that overexpression or activation of these sirtuins extends lifespan in several contexts, in East, in flies, and, and more recently a couple of, of papers in mice uh, shown that overexpression or activation of these sirtuins extend lifespan. My lab stay away of, of the lifespan uh, field. Uh, we were interested in the biology of these proteins. We found very unique that some of these chromatin factors evolve uh, to sense NAD levels in the cell and act upon it as, as metabolic regulators. Um, there are seven mammalian homologs, seven mammalian what are called sir twins, uh, because they are all homologs of the sir two protein in yeast. That's the name sir two like or sir twins, um, and we focus on sir six for the simple reason that among the seven mammalian homologs, uh, it was the only one that evolved to work almost exclusively on chromatin. Some of these mammalian sir twins work on the mitochondria exclusively, sir four, five, and uh, three. Uh, some of them shuffle. CIR6 evolved to be almost exclusively on chromatin all the time. Uh, so I've been working on chromatin and epigenetics for many years. We work on DNA methylation in my previous lab. Uh, so I said, okay, if I will pick one of these proteins to try to understand in chromatin how they sense metabolism, then, then I will s uh, stick to the one I can characterize better. And this was CIR6. And I think we were lucky in, in our uh, choices because when we generate uh, uh, Sir, uh, deficient animals for each one of these sirtuins, uh, all of them one way or another, and I won't uh, develop too much into it. Uh, we, actually, we characterize sir six, and you will see why. Uh, but all of them come up one way or another with different metabolic abnormalities if you challenge them uh, enough. So it's no doubt that they evolve, all of them, uh, quite broadly, but uh, to, to modulate metabolism in different contexts. As I said, CIR6, we were lucky that we chose that one when we generated the CIR6 deficient mice. Uh, they came up with a very unique uh, uh, phenotype. And I, I wasn't keen to go into metabolism, uh, but, but you need to follow uh, phenotypes. If that's, it's unwise not to. Uh, and the phenotype that these animals developed, I will show you in the next slide. Uh, this was around 10 years ago when we started working on CIR6. And this is from a review we wrote uh, this year. Actually, there are at least uh, 30 different papers showing that CIR6 evolved mostly to work as an histone deacetylase. Uh, so it's really conserved function with the yeast homologue in many different concepts. Uh, it's, it's clearly acting on glucose metabolism, on lipid metabolism. There are papers showing a function in telomere maintenance. And, and several of these I will touch upon in the next few slides. There are roles in DNA repair that I will touch upon. Uh, so I will show you some of our contributions to this field. But it's definitely a molecule that has emerged in recent years as a key uh, chromatin modulator of, of uh, different biological functions, in particular 
uh, metabolism. So this is the, the, the animals are born quite normal uh, in a Mendelian ratio, uh, but after a few days, they acutely degenerate and develop a very severe metabolic abnormality. So the first characteristic we notice in these animals is a profound hypoglycemia. Okay, born normally for 10 days, they keep normal. This is glucose levels in blood, and this is the knockout animal. So you see that after 10, 12 days, it's, it's normal glucose levels. After that, glucose starts going down before they are one month of age. So in the span of two weeks, each one of these animals die from a fatal hypoglycemia. Uh, the blood glucose level is basically not sustainable for life. They are with a coma hypoglycemic. Uh, this is by removing this chromatin factor. So this for us was already quite interesting why we take a particular chromatin factor, they develop this very unique metabolic characteristic. So this was one important thing we, we noticed and we wanted to characterize. The second thing we noticed that the cells in culture that they don't have CIL6, they end up accumulating genomic instability. So we, the accumulator will show you chromosomal aberrations, sensitivity to genotoxic damage. For many years, and this, we, we discovered this when I was still a postdoc, um, we discovered the phenotype. We didn't understand why lack of this chromatin factor caused these uh, defects that leads to genomic instability. So when I started my own lab here, when I joined the MGH in 2007, uh, there were really two questions we wanted to address. So we have these very strong phenotypes. Let's try to go back and try to understand uh, mechanistically what was going on. So we concentrated first on the metabolic abnormality. These animals were dying from this homo hypoglycemic. Uh, so I will show you first what we found out using a model, and I will show you some of the data in the next few slides. This was published a few years ago now. Uh, but what we found out that this chromatin factor, work on chromatin as an histone deacetylase, it's control a unique set of glycolytic genes. And here are some of the examples. Well, you can see these are pyruvate dihydrogenase kinase, PDK1, lactate dehydrogenase, and GLUT1, the glucose transporter. These genes are maintained in a repressed state by CIL6 because CIL6 is sitting on these genes and is repressing a known transcription factor that you are probably familiar with, uh, HIF1 alpha, hypoxia inducible factor 1. Now, you are maybe familiar with HIF because of the factor that is activated under condition of hypoxia. So I, some of you are, are less familiar with the fact that actually HIF also uh, controls response to low nutrients. So if you put cells under low nutrients conditions, HIF gets as much activated as under hypoxia conditions. Why? Because it's, HIF sits on many glycolytic genes. And so what you do, you basically shift metabolism in these cells to go through this period of stress. So normal cells, will keep CIL6 on these genes, so the most of the glucose that enter the cells will be converted into pyruvate, and this pyruvate will go to the mitochondria uh, to produce ATP through mitochondrial respiration. This is the most efficient way to burn pyruvate, the most efficient way to produce ATP in the mitochondria. And most of your cells in your body that are resting cells, you don't have many cells highly proliferative in your body, will basically keep CIL6 as a key break to inhibit expression of these glycolytic genes. So most of the pyruvate will go to the mitochondria for efficient ATP production. Now, if your cells are experiencing low nutrient conditions or hypoxia, they will shift uh, their metabolism, they will kick out CIL6 from the nucleus, from chromatin. This will allow HIF1-alpha to be transactivated. HIF1-alpha will recruit co-transcriptional activators. And one of the long-known transcriptional activators of HIF1-alpha is P300. This was discovered by David Livingstone almost 20 years ago, much before it was recognized that P300 is actually an acetyl transferase. Uh, so what you get is acetylation of these uh, uh, genes. Uh, you get activation of several of these glycolytic genes and a shift. It's, you have what is called a glycolytic switch, where the cells reduce respiration in the mitochondria because they don't have enough oxygen, they don't have enough nutrient to sustain the TCA cycle in the mitochondria, and you basically shift to produce lactate. It's a, 
less preferred mechanism to produce ATP, but gives these cells a window of opportunity to survive while conditions where metabolic conditions improve. So we showed that CIR6 play a key role in controlling this switch, and basically the animals were dying because two particular tissues uh, in these animals, skeletal muscle and brown adipose tissues, were uptaking glucose because of this increase in GLUT1. The glucose transporter was constitutively upregulated, and those tissues were uptaking glucose in an uncontrolled manner, to a point that you managed to deplete glucose in blood, and the animals were dying because of lack of glucose uh, reaching the brain. So we showed this just a few years ago, uh, but what we noticed at that time, and I will show you some of the data, basically this is lactate levels, this is in embryonic stem cells in culture. So we generated homozygous deletion of CIR6 in embryonic stem cells in culture, and you get this phenotype even and cell autonomous in culture. This is increased lactate on those cells. The same is true if you look at the senum of these CIR6 deficient animals. They start accumulating lactate uh, because of this switch uh, towards glycolytic metabolism. At the same time, respiration is reduced. This is again in the ESLs. cells. Uh, we use a, a seahorse analyzer, a machine that can measure oxygen consumption rates in live cells. And you can see comparing the wild type in red with the knockout in blue, that these cells are respiring less. So the moment you take away these chromatin factors, uh, they will prefer to do uh, lactate, to produce lactate. And this is also verified by metabolomics, where we measure it in collaboration with Clary Klisch at the Broad Institute, several of the intermediate metabolites. I don't want you to read the list, I just want you to see uh, that basically uh, whatever is in blue here, these are intermediate metabolites of the TCA cycle reduced in the knockout cells, consistent with these cells going through less uh, uh, in the Krebs cycle less respiration. We proved that this was a direct effect for CIR6. I mentioned it's a chromatin factor, so we can use a technique called a chromatin immunoprecipitation, or CHIP, where you can chop down uh, your chromatin, you cut your chromatin into pieces, and you use an antibody to bring down small pieces of chromatin and use an antibody against your protein of interest. Then you purify the DNA from those pieces and using PCR you can tell which genes are enriched in this population which indicates where your protein was sitting. And when we did that with an antibody against CIR6, we saw that CIR6 was sitting in each one of these metabolic genes that I mentioned before. So CIR6 directly sits on those genes, control expression of these genes. And I mentioned CIR6 work as an histone deacetylase. It removes acetyl groups from histones, and by removing acetyl groups, compact histones and repress transcription. If that's the case, we will predict that in the absence of CIR6, we will see upregulation of acetylation in particular histone marks. Now, CIR6 target a particular lysine in histone H3 called lysine 9, and when we chip against an antibody for the acetylated form of this lysine, we notice that the knockout cells, so here we use the knockout cells as a control. You don't expect to see any CIR6 signal. Here we use the knockout cells as part of the experiment, and when you compare the white bars, which is the wild type cells, with the gray bars that are the knockout cells, we see a clear increase in, in histone acetylation in this lysing A3K9, indicating that if you remove CIR6, K9 goes up and you get a constitutive expression of these glycolytic genes, which can explain this metabolic uh, shift toward glycolytic metabolism. Now, when we were doing this experiment, and I, I, I was recruited to the cancer center as a basic biologist, and I told Dan Haver, look, I don't do cancer research. I work with this group of protein called CIR twins. They have a very interesting biology, but I don't do cancer, cancer research. He said, look, I don't care. If you do good science, I am sure that the cancer center will, will, will take advantage of you and we will learn things from your, from your experiments. Now, but you are in this, in this uh, environment of cancer, so you tend to think about cancer. And when we were doing this experiment with CIR6, we immediately noticed that if you remove CIR6, these cells, even in culture, start producing lactate even when we have them under normal oxygen conditions. The same with the animals. They were not experiencing hypoxia uh, or low nutrients, and yet they were constitutively activating this glycolytic switch. Now, we knew for many years, and, and Nabil introduced this concept, that 
um, cancer cells have a very particular metabolism. And this was described many, many years ago by an amazing scientist called Otto Warburg. Uh, he worked in Germany, and in the beginning of the 20th century, he already noticed that cancer cells prefer to do uh, uh, glycolytic metabolism, lactate production, even under normal oxygen conditions. He called that aerobic glycolysis. To distinguish from the phenomenon that Pasteur described as anaerobic glycolysis, that you see when, when cells are fermenting because they don't have oxygen to, to respire. Uh, so he called this aerobic glycolysis. For many years, we didn't know why cells prefer to do cancer cells prefer to do aerobic glycolysis. Warburg got one thing wrong, which was he said these cancer cells are so screw up uh, functionally that they don't have mitochondria. Their mitochondrial functions wrong, so they have no choice but to work through aerobic glycolysis. They, ca they cannot use mitochondria for respiration. So this was one thing that he got wrong. We know now that cancer cells keep their mitochondria quite functional, uh, but they do the switch because they benefit from producing lactate from slowing down entrance of pyruvate to the mitochondria. I won't go into it. Uh, now, but it, it provides a metabolic advantage so the cells can acquire biomass. They don't, cancer cells don't need only ATP. They can get ATP through many different sources, but they do need to increase their biomass for lipids, for membranes, uh, amino acids, for proteins, and nucleotides for DNA content. And they do that one way by, by slowing down uh, metabolism of pyruvate. Uh, so this is called the Warwood effect. Again, uh, for many years, we didn't know why Warwood effect occurs. We now know some of the uh, characteristics of why cancer cells do the Warwood effect, yet how the cells do the Warwood effect remain actually a black box uh, for many years. How cancer cells adapt uh, to push uh, lactate metabolism was really unknown. Uh, and here we have a chromatin factor that work on chromatin, we remove it, and we get this phenotype almost constitutively on those cells. So we ask the hypothesis on whether this was precisely the, the phenotype we saw in CIR6 deficient cells. We ask the hypothesis, do cancer cells get rid of CIR6 as to acquire a metabolic advantage? Uh, and the answer is yes. That's why I am speaking here today to a cancer audience. Uh, so CIR6 is acting clearly as a tumor suppressor uh, by modulating this, this metabolic switch. Uh, this we published a couple of years ago, our first observations where, if you, this is first, we started with fibroblasts, we did a few simple experiments and move into more uh, sophisticated ones to really convince ourselves that CIR6 acts as a tumor suppressor. Uh, we first took fibroblasts, these are immortalized fibroblasts. If you take immortalized fibroblasts and you inject it into a new mice, uh, they will never develop tumors. They need to acquire a, a second hit, an oncogenic activation. When we did that with the CIR6 deficient cells, uh, we readily got tumors. Every time we injected these cells, we got tumors in these animals just by getting rid of CIR6 and, and a checkpoint like a P53. You didn't need to activate oncogenes. Uh, in vitro is the same, so these are soft agar colony formation assay. In the wild type cells, you need to include the RAS and oncogene or MIC or T antigen uh, to get these colonies. If you take CD6 deficient cells, it's enough to get rid of the checkpoint P53. You got beautiful colonies growing. So you transform these cells by getting rid of CD6. And when we look biochemically, most of the classic oncogenic signal in pathway were not activated. We didn't see phosphoerc downstream of RAS being activated. We didn't see phosphoerc AKT or CPI3K signaling being activated. The main thing that these cells show was a huge upregulation of these glycolytic genes that I mentioned before. And here are two examples, PDK1, lactate dehydrogenase. So it appears that by pushing metabolism, we are making these cells go through a transforming phenotype. And meta this metabolic shift, it's actually a driver in the phenotype. We took these knockout cells, we knocked down PDK1, one of these rail limiting enzymes, pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase 1, and by genetically uh, getting rid of PDK1, this basically these tumors cannot grow. Here are the same knockout cells without PDK1. We get these white masses, uh, which are basically the cells that we injected. They cannot sustain growth if you inhibit metabol glycolytic metabolism in these cells. And the same is true in vitro, basically no colony formation. Uh, but this was all with fibroblasts, so we decided to turn to a more physiological model. I told you that CIR6 deficient mice die 
very early because of this hypoglycemia. So we couldn't use the full knockout animals for our uh, tumor experiments. So we decided to generate a conditional allele where we can delete CIR6 genetically, specifically in the intestine, by crossing CIR6 with the billing Cree uh, mouse to delete CIR6 specifically in the intestine. And we cross these animals with the APC main mouse model of colon cancer. Now, APC mean in, the, in mice, the APC mean alone give you only adenomas. Few of them are never invasive. When we cross these animals with the CIR6 flocks, we got much more number of tumors in the intestine. They were bigger, and we actually got invasion, uh, high-grade invasion in these tumors uh, by, by getting rid of CIR6. Uh, so again, you take this unique chromatin factor, you push metabolism in these cells to a point that you make uh, tumors that are usually low grade, very aggressive and, and, and invasive. Is this phenotype also depending or relying on this glycolytic switch? And the answer is yes again. In this case, we took a small molecule called dichloroacetate. Uh, you may be familiar with it. This is a molecule that was discovered um, more than three decades ago. Uh, there was one clinical trial in Canada uh, at the time where people started thinking that this following the, or the world would affect. They were looking for glycolytic inhibitors. There was one clinical trial that I think was halted because of liver toxicity in, in, a, in the patients. In the mice, DCA worked fantastically well. Uh, they tolerate DCA very nicely. And, and, and you can give them even in water. So these are animals treated in drinking water with DCA for a few weeks and we follow tumor development. And just concentrate on this side of the, of the figure. These are the CIR6 flux animals, both the low grade and the high grade. Low grade are almost gone, high grade are completely disappear uh, if you give these animals in water dichloroacetate, this, this small molecule inhibitor of PDK1. And actually, the pathologists that analyze these animals told us, I think you messed up your, your genotypes. These are not CIR6 deficient animals. They, we, we only see microadenomas. Uh, so we had to go back, take the tumors from these animals, genotype again, and they were all correctly genotyped. So by, by giving DCA in water, these animals basically uh, don't develop tumors. Is this relevant in human uh, context? So we took several data sets. Uh, this is the cancer cell line encyclopedia, the CCLE, looking for gain or loss of C the CIR6 locus. And you can tell just by looking at blue or red, most of the uh, lines uh, basically got rid of CIR6. That's, that's why you see mostly blue uh, in the range of, of 25 to, to 50 percent of the lines we looked, uh, they have CIR6 deleted uh, rather than, than, than uh, uh, copy gain, which only we saw it in one particular case that we can discuss later. But most of these tumors uh, or lines get rid of CIR6. Those that don't get rid of CIR6 by deletion do so by down-regulating CIR6 at the level of expression. And here are two examples. This is from patient samples, not lines. Uh, from the geo data set of the NCI. Here is pancreatic cancer, here is colorectal cancer. You see a clear down regulation of CIR6 in compared to normal tissue, and concomitantly on the same samples, you see up regulation of these glycolytic genes I mentioned before. So y these cells are selectively down regulating CIR6, and uh, we believe it's because it gives them an, a metabolic advantage. Now, in the colon, uh, we can look at different stages. So we look, went back and look in this samples to see how early they are getting rid of CIR6. And this for us came somehow as a surprise uh, because people in the cancer metabolism field tend to believe uh, that this is a late adaptation. One, tumors are growing and they're bigger. They are experiencing, some areas are experiencing hypoxia. They are selectively for being much more rapidly proliferating. They need to acquire this Warburg effect adaptation. Uh, so our results suggest that they are getting rid of CIR6 very early. This is stage one colon cancer. And we have now data from adenomas where we're C6, CIR6 being already downregulated. So this appears to be a very early adaptation 
that these cancer cells are doing and because it's providing them with advantage even very early. And I don't have data to show you, but we have now uh, some preliminary results that suggest that this adaptation is occurring even we see it in, in, a, in the context of intestine, at least in, in stem cells, in the intestinal stem cells, that they are switching to glycolysis uh, if they are starting to be transformed. Uh, in, in the same model of uh, the APC mean, uh, using an LGR5 um, uh, marker of, of, of intestinal stem cells. So this appeared to be a very early adaptation, uh, and which really explain why it's, it's appeared to be a driver. We get rid of metabolism, these cells cannot grow. Now, we were surprised that there were no touching of any classic oncogenic signaling pathway. Uh, I mentioned we, we, we believe that really metabolism is driving this phenotype, but for us it was a surprise that the only thing these cells are doing is producing lactate as an adaptation. Uh, so we decided to look a little more unbiased, and for this we did genome-wide chipset, the same chip that I mentioned before, where we chip CIR6 and we look at the glycolytic targets. Here we did genome-wide chipset, so we chip CIR6 and we look unbiased where CIR6 is sitting to try to see it's really only controlling expression of glycolytic genes. And I don't want you to read uh, this small letter here, but this, every place where you see an arterisk, these are ribosomal protein genes that are MIC targets, okay? So CIR6 appear to be controlling expression of ribosomal protein genes by co-repressing MIC. The moment we remove CIR6, we were not only pushing glycolysis, we were activating expression of ribosomal protein genes. And we proved that the same as CIR6 does for HIF on glycolytic genes, is doing for MIC on ribosomal protein genes. And we look actually two-thirds of MIC targets are co-repressed by, by CIR6, which for us was a big surprise. We didn't expect such a correlation. This was by comparing our own chipset data with published data by Rick Young uh, showing MIC targets genome-wide, at least in embryonic stem cells. And when we use a MIC reporter, uh, the luciferase reporter for MIC, where we overexpress CIR6, we saw repression of MIC uh, reporter, again, consistent with CIR6 co-repressing MIC on its targets. So we came with this model. This was, again, as we finished this paper in 2012, where we believe that cells, cells that manage to get rid of this very downstream factor is a chromatin histone deacetylase. The moment you get rid of this downstream factor, you are giving these cells a very unique advantage, both at the level of metabolism, they increase glycolysis to a point that this becomes a driver in the phenotype. But at the same time, you are upregulating expression of key ribosomal protein genes, likely explaining why you don't need uh, to, to activate classic oncogenic signaling pathway. We, didn't, we never see MIC being amplified. Uh, and we believe it's because the moment you take the repressor, the levels of endogenous MIC is enough uh, to give you this increase in ribosomal protein gene expression. So it, it got a lot of noise at that time again because it was the first demonstration that, that you can drive these phenotypes through a metabolic shift. So it really put metabolism in the, in the driver's seat. That's how uh, uh, some of the of the new views that came out uh, uh, characterized CIR6. And I think it's just because it evolved at being a downstream factor to rapidly modulate this, this metabolic shift, uh, giving these cells a unique metabolic advantage. Uh, so I will show you some of the newer data now. At that time, we had only the human uh, data suggesting that in pancreatic cancer, CIR6 was of down-modulated level of expression. So at that time, we I had a, a postdoc joining my lab and saying, I want to look in pancreatic cancer. Uh, it's still one of the deadliest uh, cancer, and we have probably the best collaborator, uh, Nabil uh, Bardisi, uh, as, as a neighbor in, in my floor. Uh, so we knew we can gain access to some of the of the genetic model, mouse models, uh, to test whether in the context of pancreatic cancer, CIR6 may be playing a role as a tumor suppressor. I was a little reluctant. It's a, it's a perfect model, so I don't need to introduce you for, for looking at a stage uh, development of, of cancer. Um, we know a lot about how, how uh, pancreatic cancer uh, progressed. Uh, I was a little reluctant on, on testing the role of CIR6 in this model for the unique reason that there are several papers, mostly from, from Alec, 
uh, Kimmelman, with Ron and, and Nabil, showing that actually RAS itself, uh, as you know, 90-95% of, of pancreatic cancer has RAS mutations. And RAS itself has been shown to play a unique role in modulating metabolism in pancreatic cancer. In particular, uh, glycolysis is regulated by RAS in a way that supports a few branches of glycolysis through the pentos fossil pathway, for instance, that provide these this pancreatic uh, cancer cells with a metabolic advantage. So when, when this postdoc that joined my lab told me, uh, Sita told me, I want to look into pancreatic cancer, I was a written uh, hesitant. I said I, I would be surprised that in the context of RAS, we will see an effect for CD6. We will be trying to push uh, the envelope too much. Uh, but, but thank God, as, as usual in my lab, my postdoc don't listen to me too much. So she went on and started a, a quite an expensive experiment uh, that, that took, but the good thing that she did it so early on that we knew that a year after she started, we will have the, the right combination of, of crosses to tell whether C6 played a role or not. And she proved me wrong. Uh, surprisingly, she proved me definitely wrong. So this is the, the, in the context of the P53 KRAS uh, mutant animals. Uh, where you can see these animals usually come up with disease uh, around at 20, between 20 and 25 weeks uh, median survival. And you can tell this is the pink here uh, is the curve for the flock flock CIR6 animals. So the moment you get rid of CIR6, we push the curve in pancreatic cancer one third uh, faster. They're coming up with a median survival of 15 weeks. Actually, in the, in the new data is 15.1. I didn't update the slide for, for what uh, Sita told me. Uh, so it's really, these animals are dying much faster. They are not only dying much faster. In 50% of these animals, we find lung metastasis. Uh, so, so the, K5, the KRASP53 model, it's rarely uh, you see metastasis in the lung, much more in the liver, much rarely in the lung. So by getting rid of CD6, uh, we are seeing these animals developing pancreatic cancer much faster and with, with metastasis to the lung. Now, does this depend on, on glycolysis? We still don't know fully. I will show you some of the data. And uh, I'm sorry, so in, in the second model we tried, so she pushed the system even further. She said, I will cross the six to KRAS alone. And I said, Sita, you will not get tumors in the context of KRAS alone. These animals come never, without P53, you almost never see tumors. They come after a year and a half, close to two years. So she did the experiment, and, and she got tumors actually after around 40 weeks. We started seeing tumors by getting rid of C6. So even uh, in the context of, of uh, KRAS alone, we see appearance of, of uh, pannings very early. So if you sacrifice animals, uh, at earlier time points, you see panning coming up earlier in these animals. So again, either through a metabolic adaptation, we still don't know, or other means, uh, CIR6, if you delete CIR6, you are giving these pancreatic tumors a, a huge advantage. We do see glycolytic changes. So this is some of the lines that we made from those animals. These are human lines where we knock down or overexpress CIR6. If you overexpress CIR6, you see the predicted changes in histone, uh, the acetylation, and the predicted decrease in PDK1. So we are affecting glycolysis in these animals. Uh, this is uh, FDG glucose uptake. Uh, if you express CIR6 back in these knockout cells, you see glucose uptake going down, and they, they grow less. So we know that glycolysis is affected in these cells, and you can modulate this glycolysis by bringing back CIR6. Uh, but when we try the same drug, the DCA, the dichloroacetate, um, and we don't know whether it's because the drug has less uh, capability to access these tumors, uh, but we saw a partial response compared to what we saw in colon cancer. Uh, so you see here that we see the curve, this is the black curve compared to the pink one. Uh, so the animals go exactly to the middle uh, compared to the control. So they are not fully rescued by DCA, you have some rescue. So something else must be going on besides glycolysis. And we are actively characterizing metabolically these tumors and their metastasis to see what uh, are they acquiring by, by getting rid of CIR6. So that's a summary for this first part, and I will introduce you a second part so you, so you see how biology is never as simple as, as we wish. Um, 
I was happy with this result. I said, okay, we figured out what CIR6 does. It's a metabolic regulator, although we work on chromatin, and we knew it, it sits in a lot of places in, in chromatin, but that's the main thing it's able to do, is control glycolytic metabolism, and, and so and that, that's the main role for CIR6. But on, on, on the back of my mind, I always came back to these results. We knew that we got rid of CIR6, and the cells start accumulating genomic instability. Uh, so in these few, last few minutes, I will just show you some of the results that explain why lack of CD6 uh, give you genomic instability. And uh, this is the work of another talented postdoc that she joined the lab and she decided to go for a biochemical approach. She said, I want to uh, immunoprecipitate CD6 and see what CD6 is interacting with to try to learn some of the CD6 biology. And what she found that if CD6, when, we, when we did immunoprecipitation for CD6, one of the main things that came down, the top a protein that came down with CIRSIC is a chromatin remodeler called SNF2H. Um, we validated the, the interaction. SNF2H is a, is a member of the ISY ATPA's family of, of chromatin remodelers. So they are able to slide or, or eject nucleosomes as a way to open chromatin. And I mentioned CIRSIC is an histone deacetylase. Okay, so here we have an histone deacetylase uh, speaking, talking to a chromatin remodeler. And by the time we started this experiment, there were very few examples of such crosstalk between histone, an histone modifier and an ATP-dependent remodeler. So we decided to follow up uh, uh, this interaction. And one thing that caught my eye, that there were experiments showing that SNF2H may modulate DNA repair. So we said maybe CIR6 is acting with SNF2H to modulate DNA repair. Uh, and this also came out of some of our early experiments showing that if you treat these cells with ionizing radiation, uh, the interaction between CD6 and CD2H was increased, uh, which is shown here. So we basically went one step ahead and said if CD6 is acting on DNA damage, we should be able to see, literally see, that CD6 moves to sites of DNA breaks. Uh, you can do this uh, these days. We have a technique called laser-induced DNA breaks where the same laser that you have uh, to illuminate your cells in a confocal microscope, you can tune that laser to create double strand breaks on your cells. You basically draw lines, and these lines are lines of double strand breaks. And you can fix the cells and follow those lines. And when we did that for CD6, this is a marker of double strand bre uh, breaks, DNA breaks, gamma H2AX, or for foliated H2AX. So you see where the laser went in these cells, and you can tell here when we use a GFP, a fluorescent marker for CD6, we usually give you a diffuse pattern. We saw very nice CD6 moving to site of breaks. Not only is moving to site of breaks, here what you see is sniff to H moving to those breaks, and if you knock down CD6, this is concentrated here at 30 minutes. Walter cells still have plenty of sniff to H on breaks. In the knockdown CD6 cells, you cannot see any sniff to H there. So CD6 bring SNF2H to site of breaks, and it's required to keep SNF2H in those breaks. Why? I will pass this fast. We use another technique where you can generate this one unique double strand break, and you can follow that break with different technologies. We show using this approach uh, that SNF2H in wild type cells is recruited to this unique break in the knockdown cells, not. And you can tell there is a break here that is repaired by appearance of GFP. The Walter cells have very nice appearance of GFP. The knockdown CIR6 cells, no repair. So if you don't have CIR6, these cells are not repairing breaks the way they should. And I will not elaborate on this. What we prove is that this depends on chromatin accessibility. So if you don't have CIR6, basically these cells uh, don't uh, open chromatin the way they should. And we prove this using micrococal nucleus. We test accessibility of the, of the nucleosomes. And very heavy slide. All I want you to see that there are here lines, no lines here, no lines here, no lines here. And this tells basically that the repair factors, RPA, BRCA1, BRCA1, and, and 53BP1, are not recruited to site of breaks if you don't have CIR6 or SNF2H. So those two chromatin factors are moving to site of breaks to open chromatin and allow repair factors to come. And basically, this was the model we came up. Uh, we showed that CIR6 evolved to recognize these breaks. The moment it moves there, brings SNF2H, slide nucleosomes to open chromatin, and by opening chromatin allows for more efficient recruitment of DNA repair factors. So we believed we, we 
And I think it was really fortuitous. We didn't know when we started 10 years ago to work with CIR6 how much biology we will be learning from this protein. So it's, evolved, it's a key NAD-dependent factor. It sends metabolic changes and is sitting in a lot of glycolytic and ribosomal genes as a key factor to control expression of these genes. The moment you get rid of CIR6 in a normal mouse, in 12 days you are dead from hypoglycemia. If you are a cancer cell, you benefit from a push in, into a metabolic uh, uh, glycolis, in, in glycolytic switch. So it's a key chromatin factor, and at some point during evolution, it evolves to also recognize double strand breaks to a point that it moves away of some of these targets uh, because this provides an advantage. Uh, so it's a key modulator of both glycolysis or metabolism and genomic integrity. And I think we will be learning still a lot more in, in, in the coming years. So I will keep you uh, updated. Uh, with this, I will stop. This is a summary of what I told you. And I will acknowledge the people. This has done a fantastic group of people in my lab. Uh, the people who did this work is Lei Song on the original experiments, uh, Sita on the pancreatic tumors, Carlos on the original tumor samples, and Debbie on the, on the DNA repair. Uh, defects. So with this, I will stop and, and take questions. This is, I'm sorry, this I call productivity in the lab. Four of my eight posts got pregnant last year. <laughs> so that's the, when I asked me, how productive is your lab? I said, look, this is how productive my lab is. And now I, I, with this, I will stop and take questions. Looking at uh, the C bio portal, I don't see uh, CERT6 lost very often at a genomic level. So, is there much data on methylation of CERT6? I can't see much on entry PubMed. I'm glad. That, so, that's, that's the power of the internet. So, while I am speaking, people can check. And I knew, <laughs> I knew I would get this question. I got this question from Luke Huntley three years ago when we were starting this experiment. He raised his questions, his hand, and said, So, so do you find mutations for CIR6? I would expect CIR6 to be mutated. And we see very low levels of mutations. Uh, this was three years ago, three years after. We still can't explain fully why cells don't like to get rid of CIR6. I can give you a few explanations. But that being said, so we collaborated with Gadi Gates uh, here at the, at the Cancer Center. We found nine mutations in, in different tumors, mostly uh, non-small uh, lung uh, cancer. Um, I think it's because of the amount of, of uh, numbers that were there to look. I don't think it's statistically relevant on that particular tumor. We found nine mutations, was very low, uh, but we did follow, we created each one of these mutations, each one of them get rid of CIR6 activity. So they've been selected for in those tumors. Why in general tumors don't like to get rid of CIR6 by mutations, we don't know. Mostly they do so by being down-regulated at their expression. We started looking, there is a very concerned CPG island in the promoter of CIR6, and we started looking at methylation in collaboration with Gadi. We still don't see very dramatic changes. We did found a polymorphism, a few KB upstream that we are starting to look, which there was a correlation with the polymorphism and tumors uh, in pancreas. So is there uh, much data on protein expression? So has anybody done IHC? We did protein? it for, for pancreas. I didn't have time to show you. So okay. at least in pancreas, uh, we see many of these tumor lines getting rid of CIR6 okay. at the level of protein expression, Thank you. clearly. So how about the CIR6 activator? Uh, we can talk about it. It's, it's, it will be tough. Uh, Raul, I just wanted to ask whether the HIF targets that you see regulated by CIRT6 loss, are they specifically the metabolic targets? Uh, HIF has also been implicated in sort of the stemness phenotype and also migratory features and potentially explaining how you get increased um, metastasis uh, upon angiogenic inhibitors. Yeah, so, yeah. It, it's a good point. We didn't go back in the pancreas uh, uh, model yet on the HIF targets. We did this in the original experiment we did with the ESLs, and it appears to be the metabolic one specifically. So there, at least BEGF was definitely not upregulated. And we look at some of the other genes related to angiogenesis mostly, um, and we didn't see any change. So it's, I don't know if it's just because of the way CIR6 is being recruited to these metabolic genes. It was a particular effect on the metabolic genes.